welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shown. I'm joined by Ied Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Hello. Good morning. Today we are discussing William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, the last book in our series Bad Adaptation, Good Books Made into Bad Films. For this episode, we have writer, publisher, and man from the South, John Seeley, joining us. Hello, John. Hi there. John, how is the South? <laughs> you know, I have some running dialogue with a few other Southern writers about that. For many years, I was kind of going on the road with some books, kind of arguing, no, the South doesn't exist anymore. Yes, I remember this from our last conversation, the moviegoer. A lot of them disagree with me, and it's not something I'm really willing to uh, fall on my sword for. But I do think there is something that is still processing the way the um, you know the internet and social media and our interconnected world has changed the physical reality of the country to where your particular re- relationship with a place is no longer what it was a generation ago when you know you were born into a place, you grew up there, you lived there, and that was sort of your world until you you know had to physically set out to go find other ways of being today even teenagers are out on tiktok or whatever experiencing people from everywhere else so i think that's kind of changed our relationship to place kind of across the country and you know the south has long had this sort of you know mythology as a distinct region and uh, i've been thinking for a, a while about how that has changed and as that's changed people in the south some have responded by trying to consciously you know maintain some sense of the old heritage where, you know, and that takes the form of, you know, these sort of farm to table Southern biscuit joints or whatever, where they'll have like reclaimed barn wood on the, on the wall and sort of a pottery barn aesthetic. You know, I probably talked about this on our last program, but I, you know, I'm still kind of just mulling that over. But I mean, the, today I would say, I mean, I'm sitting here from Virginia. Everything's good, right? I mean, like, you know, we're strong economy and I don't know how, how else to answer how is the South? <laughs> You didn't leave us in an insurrection, so that's a positive as well. Correct, yet. Still mulling it over. We'll see what happens to Texas at some point if things keep progressing along a certain thread, but we have an insurrection again. It will be red states versus blue rather than the South versus everybody else. We talked about this in our last episode when we reviewed As I Lay Dying. This is, I'm assuming, a book that you've read maybe multiple times. What do you think about this book? I have read it three or four times. James, when you and I were at Purdue and we would teach freshman comp, I mean, I had this on my syllabus for a semester or two. Ooh, that's tough. It was fun. The kids liked it. I think it was for the accelerated comp class. I mean, it teaches well. I think it's a great introduction to Faulkner's work. It's accessible. It's pretty representative of his style and his stuff. I certainly enjoy it. And this is the first time I've reread it in more than 10 years, maybe 15 years. It's kind of interesting how it holds up in a lot of ways. You know, I think there were so many people trying to work in that style and, you know, you just sort of kind of got tired of it. But after some time away, it's, uh, it still holds up, which I, which I was pleased to see. As a kind of more general question for everyone uh, and for you specifically, John, do you see this as a comic novel or maybe a tragedy? We talked about this a little bit between the three of us, but... I feel like there's a lot of comic elements in this, and I, I think it bears repeating. I don't think the two categories are exclusive. I think that it has comedy in it, but it also has tragedy in it. I don't see any conflict. I thought that it was very dark comedy, but it is not very different from other books that are also considered Southern Gothic. And those books are also comic, but in a very dark way, like in O'Connor's short stories. Well, it's kind of funny. So, I mean, you're right. I think I agree that the categories are kind of artificial, right? But you think of, okay, the Shakespeare comedies versus the tragedies. And the comedies, everybody gets married at the end. And then the tragedies, everybody gets stabbed in the end. And at the end of the book, Ants Bundren gets remarried. So we have the new Mrs. Bundren. So I guess that means it has to be a comedy in the Shakespearean form. That's not the happy ending of a traditional comedy. I don't think we've talked about him getting married at the end of the book. Uh, That is... I think an obvious kind of rotation, right? To use a term from our last talk together, he's beginning the cycle anew. So it is funny in a way, but it's also kind of sad because you see what happened to his old wife and it's just everything's starting over again. Is that how you guys read the ending? It's a very cruel kind of perspective. It's this 
scene of suffering I see throughout the novel. It seems like everyone but Ants is paying the price for this lifestyle that he's pushed them into. And at the end of the novel, the least deserving man is the one who gets the reward. So it's this very bleak perspective on world and on human nature that Faulkner is offering us. Well, and you kind of wonder, too, what he must have talked to this poor woman about that, um, you know, he's borrowing her shovels to bury his own wife. Does she know that? Or (laughs) what bill of sale has he given her? Yeah, he's just an expert closer. You know, like you get get him in the room for just 10 minutes and he'll have you married to him. Yeah, got his new teeth and got his new bride. And it's kind of a Southern archetype, not exactly a trickster, but, you know, the sort of schemer who sort of worms his way into success. This won't mean a whole lot to the people who have read this multiple times. I don't know if you'll remember how you felt when you first read it. But when they stopped by that house at first, did you suspect what was going on? For clarity, I mean, the the only hint really, I don't remember if they call it Mrs. Bundren's house that first time. I think they do, which is a small hint, but it's very small and it's easy to miss. But also the bigger hint to me was quieter, that they were there for a long time or they were there longer than they felt they should have been while they wait for ants to come back. And they turn the music off. So it's like they've got some serious work to do. What I just want to clarify here, though, he goes to that house specifically to borrow the shovels because that's the house where Addie's relatives live, correct? Right. So then the woman that he's marrying is one of Addie's relatives. So it's like her sister or her aunt or something, which is an added layer of ridiculousness. So that's one of the points of order I was confused about then because that's what I originally thought which felt really weird. Doesn't it call it Mrs. Bundren's house? It does. I don't know which edition you guys are using, but it's like when it caches chapters. Because if it's Mrs. Bundren, they're not talking about Addie. Yeah, that would be one of Ants' relatives. Oh, interesting. I thought it was um, his deceased wife's family. I think the hint there, by calling it Mrs. Bundren, is that the characters already know. Maybe they're looking back at this moment, that this is the new Mrs. Bundren, but it's not clear. Well, if it's Darl, then it could be his kind of weird, prescient, insane point of view. That's true. I think John's right, though. I think it might be Cash's. I mean, I've got the old vintage, that kind of gold and black edition, and it's on page 236. Cash's section. Yeah, I don't know. I guess now I'm undecided. The reason why I suspected it was a member of Addie's family is because they had to travel from the farm to town specifically because they wanted to bury her beside her family. I didn't really suspect that he had any family living in town as well. So I don't think it's his family. I think it is probably some sort of a premonition or some sort of foreknowledge. I will admit that I didn't come to that conclusion on my own. I got that from someone's blog that I'm not going to repeat because I don't know how... I want to bring up some other claims. (laughs) You You and these blogs. Well, I was looking for a breakdown of a couple chapters because I wanted to try and get at a better understanding. And it was helpful in some ways, but then there were some points that I wasn't sure if I agreed with what was happening. The first is the least specious of these claims, but I want to pose this question to you guys. Does Darl try to get rid of the coffin in the river? The movie suggests that that's what he's doing, right? I couldn't tell in the movie. Right. I'm the same way. It seems to be of a piece with his characterization later on with starting the fire in the barn. He has the same motivation in both cases, but... I did not see that in the book or the film, but it's possible. That was kind of the justification that I saw this person make, at least, that kind of looking backward from the fire, that it makes sense that he was trying to get rid of it earlier in the river as well. And I read over that section a couple times, and I just couldn't decide how to feel about it, because I don't know if we get direct evidence Yeah, that to me seems like an unfair way of reading a book. You start with what one character does later, 
to kind of presume what he did earlier. I don't think that that is enough textual evidence for me to agree that he did that. Right. And this person's other species claims kind of threw that under fire a little bit. For example, this person suspected that Darl may have assaulted Dewey Dell once he knew that uh, she was pregnant and that that might account for why she attacked him at the end. And I don't know that there's any evidence of that either, that Darl used her since he knew that she had a secret that no one else knew. I mean, my takeaway from these kinds of claims is that this book is sufficiently unclear to allow people to make all manners of interpretations. And The Coffee in the River, I actually did think was suggested by the movie, but I would not feel comfortable claiming all of these facts on a blog even. This book is very open to interpretation, but some of these interpretations feel more justified than others. Do you think this is a failure on Faulkner's part that allows for something, I'm not going to say stupid, but some wild claims that obviously the reader is putting a lot into it? I mean, is, is this some fault of the book or a fault of Faulkner? I don't think so. I think there are wrong readings, but I don't think that problem lies with Faulkner, at least not here. And I kind of think that's sort of the point of what he's doing here. I mean, why tell a book and multiple short first person perspectives like what's he up to in general and the radical subjectivity we're getting here where every character is kind of experiencing this stuff in their own head which is separate from the objective reality i mean there is no narrator giving us an objective reality so it's all just fragments of subjective perspective you know along the way so i think that it opens it up for the readers to have multiple maybe conflicting views on what's happening kind of the philosophical point here last week i mentioned that one of my problems with the movie was how it clarified certain things and that's a directorial decision but this book feels purposefully unclear about certain things and when you clarify those things you're taking decisions away from faulkner deliberate ambiguity can happen on film but i think it happens in a different way it's more of a sleight of hand sort of thing or a, a series of cuts in a montage. Whereas in this text, I think a lot of it happens just because the writing is so opaque and elliptical. It's not necessarily that it's hidden from you, but that you're looking at something else and something else can be moving when you're looking the other way. Well, like the case of calling this new woman's house Mrs. Bundren's house, what does that mean? That's not a very clear explanation. Well, my favorite reading of that, if we, you know, if we circle back here, is that this is Addie's old house, and he's just marrying the new person who's living in her old house, which makes sense to me because she's from the town, so she's lived somewhere in town. He's not from the town, so... It's his source for her wives. Like, this is just where he goes to. Did just marry any old lady that's living in this one particular house? I mean, we don't know for a fact that Addie was his first wife. Maybe someone else lived in the house before her. Do you think Cash would call his own mother Mrs. Bundren? And then, if so, why does Cash talk about how his father seems to have a sixth sense for not working? When they get to that house... He stops at the one house that's playing music, and he's thinking about the music, but he's also thinking about why Ants chose this house. Yeah, let's not destroy my favorite reading of this scene, Sam. I'm just going to write a blog post about this, and people will back me up. Yeah. Speaking of, then, these open to interpretations, I wanted to talk about morality, which I think is a tough idea to pin down here. Uh, I don't know that we can say Faulkner is making a positive statement about morality, but I think he's saying something. So, for example, Addie has a section where she's talking about her sins and how sin, like love and fear, are just words for people who don't have these things. Whitfield, the person that she is having an affair with, or had an affair with, despite his conviction to confess to Ants his affair with Addie, once he gets to the house and finds out that she's already dead, he decides it must be God's will to keep it secret, and he immediately 
doubles down on his outward religiosity, but keeps the secret to himself. Also, Cash muses about whether Darl was doing the right and sensical thing in trying to get rid of Addie's coffin, and that maybe sanity and insanity both live in all of us. Is Faulkner saying something about morality? I think the broadest thing I could say is that he is against the conventional sort of morality, but I don't know if he's advancing any alternative to that. He's just saying that the way that people think and talk about morals is suspicious, and the ideas that people have about just rewards are false. This, again, I'm referring back to Anse's triumph at the end of the novel, where he does the least, and he deserves the least, and he gets the most. Another kind of ridiculous thing that Anse does in kind of justification of his laziness is also based on this conventional sense of right and wrong, when he says that he needs to get teeth. And he says, he needs to get teeth because he hasn't had teeth in several years and he needs to eat the food that men are supposed to eat. So it's like this kind of ridiculous sort of convention, even in terms of food, that determines the course of action throughout not just his life, but his whole family's lives. Throughout the book, anytime something happens to anyone, he has a phrase that something like, there's never been a man as downtrodden as me. I don't remember his exact words, but he repeats it throughout the book, even though he, like you say, doesn't really ever lift a finger to help with the situation. And there's also, I think, another character worth looking at is Cora, whose sections are told in a different tense from the rest of the story. And she is a very religious woman. And the way that her story is narrated in her chapter is quite distinct, especially from Addie, because they occupy similar positions in their respective families and similar positions in the respective social structures. But she is very sure of where she is, and she is very sure of her conception of a religious afterlife. And it's kind of painting Addie in very stark relief against her because Addie, I think, is, like Faulkner, very unconventional. This thing that you'd mentioned earlier about, you know, love and sin being just words for people who don't have those things. What does it mean specifically, I guess, for those to be just words? Why is a word not enough? What I get from her passage is a sense of resolution, a sense of things being finalized. When I get from the other narrators is things being constantly in a state of flux, things being unsettled, which I guess is kind of a textual representation of the way religious thought kind of solidifies who you are and the way that you see the world. Well, I, I really am interested in this speech because I think Addie, because she speaks in the novel, even though she's dead, and because she is such a central but mostly absent character, what she says is likely significant, right? So when she gives this kind of soliloquy, you could call it, about you know love and fear and sin being words for people who don't have those things... What exactly does that mean, and why is a word insufficient in some way? To me, it's a simplification that she doesn't like, I think. She's been unhappy for so long, and it sounds like, really, she just wanted to be left alone. So I'm not sure why she married Ants in the first place, but it seems like she feels these ideas of sin and love and fear are too simple and too small to really encompass the things that they're supposed to uh, describe. In that section, she's talking about Whitfield without really naming him. Uh, we don't find out exactly what she's talking about until much later. And you could say that she's you know, brushing aside her infidelity, but it certainly doesn't sound like Ants has given her a very nice life sounds like she went from enjoying town life as a teacher 
to out in the country stuck, not able to do anything but pump out babies. My reading is a bit broader than that. I think that it's something to do with this way that Faulkner wants to limit his ability as an author to provide truth. And the idea of there being any truth, not only in a novel, but in the way that we talk about life. And I think what she's saying is that there is some sort of a vitality or some sort of an immediate presence to these things that exists that can't really be captured the moment you try to name it and talk about it and share it with somebody else. And I think Faulkner does this, as we've been talking about, by being deliberately unclear, but also by spreading the narrative across all of these different perspectives, because there are, at least to my knowledge, there are lots of conflicting accounts and there's some overlap and it's just it's showing the limits of a single perspective on truth. I'm way out of my depth talking about Husserl and phenomenology, but I think there is kind of a uh, something going on in the 20s in the sort of zeitgeist around psychology and the um, subjective nature of reality. And think of like Jung's archetypes and the way these sort of archetypes manifested themselves through consciousness and the sort of inability of the word to capture the thing, the distinction between the thing itself and the perception of the thing or the naming of the thing or, the, you know, I think there's a little bit of that going on in this novel and the, you know, representation of all these different perspectives as trying to name the thing which is the story um so i think that that is you know kind of a pretty good point that you're bringing up around cora and she's definitely kind of represents one archetype of the sort of religious christian perspective sort of rereading the book after a long time it, i had not really thought about this years ago but Faulkner definitely has some character types that he just sort of recycles. I don't know if y'all are familiar with The Sound and the Fury, but there's kind of a very direct parallel between several characters in this novel and the characters in that novel. I mean, he's got like Darl is very much like Quentin Compson or Dewey Dell is very much like Caddy Compson. And he sort of has these sort of psychological tropes. Um, I had not picked up on it years ago, but I'm seeing it pretty clearly now where he recycles this kind of personality types. And that kind of makes sense thinking about what you're talking about is Cora as the sort of religious archetype. Ants Bundren is kind of like the Flim Snopes, amoral trickster schemer, Southern type. Darl as the sensitive poet seer type. Vardaman as the kind of, you know, mentally disabled or neuroatypical type. Yeah, I think that there is a connection that you're noticing here, John, between this kind of denial of truth and the different perspectives and archetypes that we see in the novel and a kind of a more broader look at the entire novel as a representation of a form of life or a way of expressing the feeling of being alive. Here I want to continue a conversation about narrative forms being similar to cubism. And this is something that we had talked about in a previous episode we did on uh, a novel by Jenny Ophel, a contemporary novelist called Weather. In that episode, we talked about how Ophel was interested in what she called expressing the feeling of being alive and how the fragmentary narrative form that she used might contribute to that feeling. In that same episode, James had countered that Ophel's form wasn't the only way to do that and that Faulkner achieves a similar effect as well. So I made the comparison between Ophel's form and Cubism, and I think I could make the same comparison with As I Lay Dying, even though I think that Faulkner achieves something quite distinct. The first thing I think to look at is one of the famous boasts that Faulkner made about this novel. He said to several people that he had the entire thing mentally prepared before he started writing. He had it prepared in his mind from the beginning to the final period, and he was able to completely write it in a six-month stretch. I think he was working nights as a, a security guard or something in a power plant, if I recall. Anyways, he told people frequently that this novel is a, quote, simple tour de force, which is an odd thing to say. It's almost an oxymoron. 
So when he repeatedly makes these claims that he could visualize and he could see the entire novel in his mind, and that the novel is a simple tour de force, what does he mean? And do those claims mean anything about the content or the form of the novel? Well, he's clearly having fun with us when he's saying that. And I don't think it was as easy as he seems to make it seem. It may not have taken him long to write it, but I would suspect it's not that in a single night he came up with exactly how it was going to lay out. It feels like the same energy as when he claimed that he's, what, the third best living writer or something? Or or number two? Who is number one? I don't remember. After Wolf and uh, John Dos Passos and then him and then Hemingway. Yeah, and then Steinbeck. Yeah. I mean, you never want to say you're the best writer. So he couched it a little bit, right? Just like here with Simple. But in the end, he's calling his novel a tour de force. So it feels like the same energy. I'm inclined to look into it a little bit more than that. Like, I think it has something specific. Like, not every writer, even a writer who's really, you know, enthralled with his own work, will make this claim to be able to see the entire text and the entire work in his mind. So I'm inclined to agree with the critic John Tucker. And I looked at John Tucker's 1984 essay on this novel to kind of investigate what the critical perspectives on Cubism were. And Tucker says that basically when Faulkner had the entire book ready in his mind, I think what he really meant is he had the narrative form in his mind. And that was the crucial ingredient. That was the thing that sparked the rest of the novel. And I think that, you know, Faulkner's manuscripts and his proofs survive, and we can actually see that he didn't have it ready down to the period because there are revisions. But he had something in his mind which was a powerful enough thing that he thought that it could inspire the rest of the novel. And then when he talks about it being a simple tour de force, I think what it means is that it's simple and that it's a tour de force. Normally, it's a display of mastery, right? But it's simple in the sense that it displays powerful mastery of just one area specifically. And that, to me, I think is point of view when it comes to this novel. I think that's the way that Tucker and I would account for it, but perhaps it's reading too much into it. I think that the one word simple there is maybe more playful than I'm imagining, but for me, I think it has something more to offer. Tucker goes on to talk more about cubism, and regarding cubism, he goes on to sum up the claims of some other critics before he makes his own claim. So the first one is Ilse Lind. Uh, She claims that the novel is not cubist at all. And rather, it's a symbolist or expressionist work in the sense that the novel expresses the author's complex feelings towards death in a text that's full of symbolism, such as the fish and the coffin and the horse and so on. The second critic uh, that he examines is Panthea Reed. And she says that, this is a quote, Faulkner actually facets, like a cubist painting, the design of this book. That is why it is so difficult to speak of theme in As I Lay Dying. Here we have a work of fiction that comes remarkably close to being an exercise in pure design, a true tour de force, a cubist novel. And that, he says, is the most traditional sort of analysis of As I Lay Dying as a cubist novel. And then the final critic that he looks at is Watson Branch. And Watson Branch agrees that the novel is Cubist, but he limits the Cubist influence just to Darl sections of the novels. And Branch examines Darl and his background, specifically his experience in World War I and his French spyglass, as a way of accounting for Darl's ability to see and know things about his mother's death and about uh, Jules' background and uh, Dewey Dell's pregnancy that he otherwise shouldn't be able to know about. I mean, it's clear that there are different ways to look at how this novel is Cubist or not Cubist. But for you, would you say it's Cubist at all? I don't know. I can see some of that. 
I don't know that I agree with Branch, though. If it's Cubist at all, I don't think it's limited to just Darl. Uh, I think there's evidence that it's, at the very least, that it includes Vardaman as well. You mentioned some of the, what Lind calls symbols. I can see that a little bit, but I think the use of shapes and impressions, I see that more. We talked also in Weather about uh, unclear referencing, and that is used here as well. Darl uses a lot with Jewel. He says he, but most of the time he says he without clarifying. It's a, he's talking about Jewel. But one of the more impressionistic things that comes to mind with this unclear referencing are the vultures that are constantly circling overhead. They're just black shapes, and they multiply and then disperse over the course of the novel. And that first comes through Vardaman and eventually comes through Darl. I don't know if this fits exactly with the cubist idea, but there's something about the jagged amorphous shapes that stick out to me as maybe that fits in part of this argument. We started off this discussion talking about the difference between a comedy and tragedy is not necessarily mutually exclusive. There are some artificial categories that are useful for a discussion, but I mean, is the same true of cubism versus expressionism? I mean, are they mutually exclusive? Is there something consciously cubist that like, these are the rules? There have been cubist manifestos. So there is a body of thought and I, I couldn't say that it's mutually exclusive with symbolism or expressionism because I don't think it is, but I, I couldn't be sure. But I don't think that Lind is right saying that it's not cubist. I do agree that it's possibly symbolist and expressionist in addition to cubist. Uh, I think this is the problem that I have with her, but also more specifically, I have a problem with Branch. And this is similar to what Sam is saying about the vultures. Here, we're talking about cubism in terms of the content of the novel, when I think that any discussion of cubism that focuses on content rather than form misses the mark completely. Like you have to discuss the form in order to have a real engagement with cubism. A cubist picture is not a picture of a guitar, for example. It's not the guitar that makes it cubist, but the way that the guitar is pictured. Yeah, I agree with you and Reed in that, for me, this is, if not obviously cubist, it's obviously cubism adjacent, because he's playing around with form the way a cubist artist would. He's portraying events from multiple points of view, it's something that you have to willfully do, right? Like a storyteller won't describe a scene and then in the next chapter describe the same scene again from a different character. Uh, that's not something that storytellers tend to do. So I think he's willfully incorporating cubist thought or cubist elements into the construction of this text, into how it's structured. So for me, it's pretty clearly cubist in that way. And I agree that when you start focusing on symbols, which you can, you're kind of forgetting or overlooking the most important part of the book, which is the structure or the form of it. So then here, John, you, you haven't read Weather, but in Weather, that novel is a series of textual fragments, jokes that the author has read, or the character has read rather, and television shows and conversations that she's had with other people. It's very disjointed and fragmentary. Sam and James, do you think that this form accomplishes the same thing that Weather's form accomplished? Well, I think my argument for Weather was that it wasn't cubist because the point of view is very much centered on the one character. It's only her point of view. I think that that is very important when you're creating a work of cubist literature. I mean, there really isn't a genre of cubist literature, but in my mind, the important part of this is the multiple points of view. I guess I'm more on James's side as far as weather goes, that while we're getting multiple views of a single person, I, I don't feel like we're seeing her from different angles necessarily. I feel like it's still one angle and one direction that we're mostly seeing her in her life. If we were seeing her from other people's perspective, 
maybe. I, I don't see it as cubist in the same way, certainly not in the same way that this novel feels more cubist or, or as James to put it, cubist adjacent. It is conceptually the same because I think it uses a similar sort of faceting technique that is what Reed mentions in her analysis of this novel. But I think the faceting technique is used on a different subject. And whether the fragments show us different facets in the subject is the individual character's mind, a human mind. In this novel, and as I lay dying, I think the facets don't show us a human mind, but an entire world, or at least a situation that a group of characters find themselves in. But I think the way that that subject is depicted is the same in both. So to get back to the essay, Tucker extends the idea of cubism even further in this novel. He uses a quote from John Berger, the famous art critic, and Berger says this, the cubist reduce forms to a combination of cubes, cones, cylinders, or later to arrangements of flatly articulated facets or planes with sharp edges so that the elements of one form were interchangeable with another whether a hill, a woman, a violin, or a carafe, a table, or a hand. I think what Tucker is doing with this quotation is he's making the argument that the same way that the cubists would simplify objects in a series of shapes, very simple shapes, is also happening in this novel via the image that we have of the coffin. The coffin appears not only as an object that is represented in the text, but also it appears on the page in a diagram in the beginning of the novel. And Tucker's argument is that that is, I think this is something you'd mentioned earlier, John, this is a kind of an idea that lots of other things can easily be grafted onto. So Tucker says that this serves as what he calls the germ of the novel, the shape that all of the other narratives can relate to. And in this way, once the image of the coffin struck Faulkner, it was easy for him to visualize the rest of the novel because any other narrative at all could be attached to it. Does that make sense to you? Is it cubism in the same way that Reed or Branch are talking about cubism, or is it different? I mean, that makes sense to me that the way a visual artist works is by blocking out shapes and colors and that you can strip the shape of something down into patterns of blocks to kind of bring you inside the mind of the vision for how this thing is produced. And I guess likewise, it makes sense to me that the job of a writer is to sort of in creating characters is to kind of create blocks of shapes that then gradually get more shade and nuance. So it kind of makes sense to me that there's a parallel in the way a cubist might approach a painting and the way Faulkner might have approached this story. And I guess the other angle of cubism is sort of representing three dimensions on two and turning things to the side to sort of try to present multiple perspectives in a single array. And the same thing as that Faulkner is doing here, where you're getting multiple perspectives in a, in a single narrative. Where I hesitate with this, first of all, I'm not so sure it's worthwhile trying to figure out what Faulkner's inspirations are. But I think the real stumbling block for me is that he's taking what Berger says, which is literally about the way that painters manipulate form, and he's applying it metaphorically to the way that writers write about things. And that to me is quite different because it's not the same method of connecting things. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. And because it's not a one-to-one -one thing, I don't think that the conclusions that can be drawn from one will apply to the other. Like in the same way that you can apply any two shapes together with a line, I don't think you, you can apply any two narratives to uh, a coffin and say, okay, it works because this is kind of a universal symbol. That doesn't work to me. Maybe not, but I can see the argument that the image of a coffin is so arresting and the idea of a person being simplified to that shape. And that from that point on, once she's in the coffin, she stops being 
a person and is now just this thing in a box. I can see that being such an arresting image. It could have been the germ. I don't know if that matters, but I do like the image of that being so central to the book um, that things are built around that image. I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of it. You got to have a through line for a book, right? For for it to have a, a cohesive feel, you need something to hold it together. Traditionally, you know, you'll have a single character, right? That's that's the character, you know, the Oliver Twist or whatever, or David Copperfield, you know, is born, lives a life, changes, evolves, and you have this character with a through line. But when you have multiple characters like this, the risk is it kind of spirals out into just a sequence of anecdotes that don't add up to anything. So how do you how do you have a, a particular through line and the coffin as a symbol or as an image kind of helps provide an anchor? I mean, I, I agree with all of that, but just in general, this claim that Tucker is saying that this is the germ of the novel, this is the thing that struck Faulkner and allowed him to see the rest of the novel. Is it really worthwhile to kind of investigate what an author's inspirations are? Is that a type of criticism that is rewarding to readers or critics or scholars of any sort? Rewarding is a strong word. I I don't know. I, I can see why someone like Tucker might explore that simply in trying to understand how an artist creates. But yeah, I, I agree with your question in that I don't know how important it really is. I personally feel that the book should stand on its own and provide something to say without you having to understand the author's intentions. And I don't know, unless the author has specifically laid that out and said, this is my inspiration for the book. Yeah, that's my hesitation, too. I think that people will look at this and they'll say, well, if this is his inspiration, that's a determinate thing. And that's the way that we have to approach this novel from here on out. And I think it's just a very limiting experience. It Not only can it limit it, I mean, but even if the author says, hey, this is what I'm trying to do, I think you should take that with a grain of salt because sometimes books kind of have a way of doing their thing sort of outside the intentions of the author. And the author is just sort of like a savant or a uh, a conduit for a book's existence, in my view. So. I, you know, saying, oh, yeah, this Faulkner was definitely trying to do something specific with this coffin it can be rewarding to think about. But I think there's also that limit of saying, well, that's one way of approaching it, but it's not the way or the only way. All right. Let's take a break here. When we come back, we'll talk about reading as L.A. dying today and if it still has any special resonance. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So, John, a question for you. Do you think that this book, As L.A. Dying, or Faulkner, still has any special resonance for people from the South? Because when he wrote this book, he obviously took the setting into consideration. He's very obsessed, you might say, with Mississippi and with his home county. I don't know. So my personal understanding of the world right now is I don't understand anything. So I can say that for me and for my somewhat, you know, somewhat limited circle of, of, of writer friends, um, Faulkner is still the Dixie special is what Flannery O'Connor called him. He's the uh, godfather of Southern fiction. And I think that still resonates. Is there a Southern Gothic genre still that he fits into? There is. So there is definitely still a pretty vibrant world of Southern fiction. I have these discussions with some, some, some fellow writers, though, around like how, um, how relevant it is or how 
um, particular it is because I think what has happened is there is a generation, I mean my generation essentially, of, of Southern writers are, are kind of leaning into a lot of the stereotypes of the form, kind of conscious of the sort of influence of the, the form. So my first novel was called The Whiskey Baron and it was set in the 1930s. And it was kind of set in a world that my grandparents' generation had come out of in the South Carolina cotton mills. You know, if I had written a novel like that set today, it would not have had the same Southern Gothic Faulkner tradition kind of mode because the characters would have been, you know, out on Facebook and Twitter. I mean, it was set near Charlotte and Charlotte has just exploded with growth, particularly from, you know, people coming down from the Midwest or the Northeast to settle there for, for business. So it would not have the same sense of like legacy Southerners. I think there is something kind of distinct about the South still, but it's, um, you know, making it fresh, I think is, uh, is, is, is always, is, is always the challenge. So, um, I'm in Richmond, Virginia now. And if I go into some place in Richmond, if I go into a museum or something and just flag somebody over, there's a pretty good chance that they're not from Richmond and that they might not even be from the South. So if I wanted to write a story about Richmonders, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of the characters would not be sort of legacy Southerners. Um, so there's something distinct about the place, but it's not necessarily the, uh, you know, the, the obsession with the history of the place, I think, is would, would not quite ring as true as it does in the work of Faulkner, where he just has that whole shadow of the Civil War and the, the South kind of hanging over, over him in a way that I don't, I don't know would resonate. And I think today, really, I mean, you have to deal with race in a way that um, the, the, that's, that's the angle on the South today is sort of the legacy of Jim Crow or something. I mean, so, I mean, Richmond today, the story of Richmond is the story of Confederate statues being taken down and what that means for the city and what that means for the future of the place. Part of it, I, I guess, in what you're saying is there's been so much change, right? That the South of Faulkner is almost entirely different from the South of today. It is. I mean, I think if you go into some small towns, I mean, you can still find a small town dynamic where people have been there for generations and they have a little bit of that um, consciousness of family history. But some of the themes that Faulkner was writing about that were fresh for him in his day, you know, would not be the themes for someone today to write about. You know, what still resonates with us today about Faulkner, and, and I think there's plenty that does, but you know, trying to consciously write in the Southern mode of Faulkner. I think it's been very easy for people in my generation to, and I wouldn't necessarily exclude myself either, is, um, to kind of fall into the trope rather than to pivot and find something new about the world today. And I think that's one thing that made him such a strong writer is he was able to capture, you know, the reality of felt life at, in, in its time. All right, John. So thanks for joining us today. I think we better stop here before we really take up all your time. Can you tell us and our listeners where they can find you on the internet? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to catch up and talk about Faulkner. And the best way to find me, if you just Google John Seeley, J-O-N-S-E-A-L-Y, I've got a website and you can sign up for a monthly newsletter. You know, I think the website is the best place to find me and johnseeley.com. John with no H, Seeley like the mattress company, but no relation. Oh man, you're not you're not rolling in that mattress money. I tried to find some. I looked it up. The mattresses are named for the town of Sealy, Texas. Um, although I suspect the name of Sealy, Texas, might have been named for a long lost relative. I mean, there was some South Carolina Sealys splintered, and some of them moved. When they sell a mattress and they get some cash, where do they put the cash? All right. Well, uh, thanks again for coming, John, and for your time. We'll stop here. Thank you all for listening. Next week, we will conclude this series by talking about all three of the books that we've read for Bad Adaptation, where we read good books made into bad movies. Uh, we read High Rise, The Goldfinch, and As I Lay Dying. Next week, we'll also discuss Drive My Car, the new film adapted from Haruki Murakami's short story of the same name. For that one, it's a good adaptation, so a good film and a good story, maybe. We've got an updated reading schedule that's on Reddit, at Canonical Pod. 
We also post threads for discussion every Friday. If you'd like to talk about As I Lay Dying or other film adaptations, you can find us there. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a nice review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. That really helps us grow the community. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.